your parents are interracial. So your mom is from Africa and your dad is from Guatemala, right? And your parents are um, Dominican. So all these backgrounds coming together. You forgot us. And, you know, we're here to, you know, we're all together as friends, right? My name is Walter Carcamo. I am an AmeriCorps intern for our um, MHP Montgomery Housing Partnership. Um, I work at our community life programs and we provide um, community life programs for low-income housing um, residents in our communities. So we teach fundamental math, science, and reading for our younger kids and prepare them for kindergarten. And for our older kids, we um, provide an after-school program that gives them the opportunity to have um, help and um, we encourage them to do their homework and we also provide STEM programs as well. Same like yours? Like what? So explain. Um, clothes, toys, like the room. This opportunity that I have here at MHP has been truly a blessing and um, I have grown up with this program. I have witnessed kids leave the program and do things that they're not, you know, supposed to do or things that get them in trouble in life. But honestly, I believe that this program does help those kids. It helped me. It helped me from a lot of trouble in middle school and high school. And it even gave me a job. And um, I really am grateful for this experience, especially with AmeriCorps helping me right by my side the diversity that we have in our own little Friday meetings is something that I truly take to heart. Um, having just other people, other educators, hear you out and experience what we experience and share what we experience in the classroom really gives perspectives on how we can better ourselves in our teaching methods and especially the diversity of different, you know, programs that we have with AmeriCorps definitely gives me an understanding of different techniques to use in my classroom. Okay, I have a question. There's one singing. thing. Do you, Maya, do you celebrate Christmas? Yes. Yes, in your culture you do? Yes. Okay. I personally have never um, been able to have a diverse class as I have now. Um, I've always had, you know, that Spanish community with me. And for the first time, now that I'm serving with AmeriCorps, I have been given the opportunity to lend my services and my teachings to kids in a community in Rockville. And little did I know that it was the most diverse community that I had ever seen. And um, honestly, um, seeing these different backgrounds and cultures has definitely given me a perspective. Diversity is something beautiful. Um, having different people and different cultures and backgrounds come together as one really gives you a perspective of how others, you know, are and how others have been raised. And honestly, pitting against each other is the opposite of what we should do. We should um, influence and bring more people to awareness of different cultures. Hi, my name is Bria, and I'm 24 years old, um, and this is my story. Um, it all starts like at 10 years old for me, because the memories aren't very clear before then. But on my uh, 10th birthday, is a big one, because it's supposed to be double digits and everything, I was taken into foster care because my mother was very negligent and was committing criminal acts. So, and she was in jail at the time, so no one was there. Um, and so then I just moved around a lot throughout the system, and I, you know, I've had to take care of myself, become very resilient. That just made me who I am now. You said resilient. Can you explain what does that mean? I personally hate the word. Um, I hate the word as somebody who's been through a lot of stuff, and I hate the word as a black woman. Um, as a black person, um, 
you know, like if anybody who of any race went through this, they would be resilient, right? But it means different for us because we're already being called resilient constantly about stuff we shouldn't have to be resilient about. Resiliency is a survival tactic. I've been in my apartment as an adult for like five years. That's longer, it's just crazy. That's, I've been able to maintain myself in one spot for five years when the system couldn't do it for 10. People just don't make the commitments. Like it's just like having a pet and rehoming it, basically. That's what foster care is. I have to see my future in the best way possible, like which is just being able to um, accomplish my dreams at some point and stuff because, I mean, I can't predict anything else about it. That same state, that same state of life, you know, you graduate, you get training for something, you either get a job or you go to college, those three, then you get your own apartment, you get your own place and you shouldn't need your parents or anyone's help, right? And if you do, you're not doing something right. It's still looked at it like that when, look at the world. Hmm. Look, at the, this is the highest inflation that we've had in 40 years. That's scary. Well, hello, my name is Akufuna Stali Putejo Ngonda. Uh, people call me Funa. Uh, it was, I was actually named after my, uh, my youngest brother gave me my name because he could not say my whole name. And then over the years, I became Funa. So hence, as, as we begin to know each other, that is what we call, what you should call me. And my name is Funa. And so with that, I'm here to have a conversation about education and what it actually means. And so before I do that, let me uh, introduce uh, a couple of ideas to you. So I, I'm originally from a country called Zambia, which is in Southern Africa. And we were under uh, British colonial rule um, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And during that time period, um, education was very limited. And so at the time of independence, uh, Zambia had 100 university graduates out of a nation of 11 million people. And so education was a very, very important part of how we were going to rebuild ourselves as human beings functioning and navigating in this world that we all share. So education uh, became a very important feature of, of everyday life. And so little children as well as adults began to go to school uh, children would go in the mornings, and then the, I'm going to do this. And um, when they left in the afternoon, the adults would come in and go to school. And was there? They did more than just learn how to read and write. They began to affirm who they were as people. So we think of education not so much as learning a skill, but entering your humanity and the expansion of your being. And that means being as creative as you can in your thinking. Um, being adept at handling uh, different problems and solutions, talking about big ideas, whether it's in poetry, or physics, or philosophy, in a, in a language that everyday people can understand, whether you are a subsistence farmer, or a professor, or a domestic worker. So education for us was liberation and making us into um, a people that that said, you know what, how can we be better for our, our nation? And how can we be better for this world? And how can we share information with one another? And so that's why education um, has been a benchmark of the work that I do. And I'm here in the United States and I teach, I co-teach at Sligo Middle School. And we have sixth and seventh and eighth graders trying to figure out who they are and, and what these lessons mean and the most important question that I ask is, 
How are you doing? How are you feeling? How do you understand what's going on? How does this information relate to your everyday life? And how, what lessons can you learn in this history class that can help you um, in, in your future life? And so education is that for not only um, someone coming from Zambia, but I think it's edu that should be for everyone um, across the board. It's a way of expanding your humanity, expanding your creativity, being the person that your humanity in was fully intended to be. Um, fully human, fully creative, uh, fully problem solving, and fully loving. And so that is part of the work that I do and that is a testimony that I'd like to share with you. I just want um, you to know that life comes with struggles, life comes with pain, but you have to look at them as growing pains. And that's something that I personally went through, um, especially throughout these last two years of my personal life. Um, I moved from Ohio eight hours away to a new city, not knowing anybody, um, not really having support, um, having deaths in my family, trying to figure out my way, um, especially coming right out of college. And it's it's been a journey, it's been tough, but at the same time, I've grew, I've grew in so many ways. Um, I've had a lot of growing pains, but that's okay. You know, it's kind of like when you're a kid, you know, you start to get taller, like things start to not fit anymore. And sometimes that can be frustrating, but that means that you're making room for new things in your life. Um, and throughout my journey of my struggles, um, it's not like I didn't have bad days. I definitely had bad days and you have to allow yourself that, but you can't sit in those bad days. And that's where changing your mindset comes in. That's where, you know, having a powerful mindset can help you on those bad days to really persevere through. I think when you dig deeper into self-awareness, um, and you figure out your strengths and your weaknesses, you're able to capitalize on that. Um, so when I figured out some, one of my weaknesses is sometimes I do like to just give up, like if things aren't working. So by knowing that about myself and being accountable for that, you know, you have to know what's wrong before you can adjust or fix it. Um, and so by me knowing that, um, that led me to take steps, you know, even something simple as, creating a vision board. So even on the days that I wanna give up, when I wake up every morning, like I see what I want um, and it's been successful. Um, even other simple things like writing post-it notes around my house of words of encouragement. So I'm, I'm a visual type of person. So when I get up and I see those, then that helps me keep my mindset on track. Um, and that's pretty much how I reshape my mindset. Um, by doing things like that every day, knowing my weaknesses and figuring out ways to combat like that negative thought in my head every day. Hi, my name is Jacoby Codden and I'm a member of Project Change AmeriCorps and I wanted to share with all of you a new and growing industry known as eSports. eSports is very similar to traditional sports such as soccer, football, uh, basketball, but it's played digitally on a computer or a gaming console. Esports for me is everything. It's been with me my entire life. I've been playing video games since I was a little kid, maybe three or four years old. And when I got 12, I found League of Legends, the game where I've met all of my friends, all my, all my childhood friends, my, my closest friends. When I was a kid, I didn't care about anything. I just was depressed. I just went through went through school, went through life. I just didn't care. 
The only thing that I cared about was coming home and talking with my friends and playing League of Legends. And eventually as esports grew, I grew as a person. As I saw these people winning trophies and gaining recognition for being a gamer, I, I originally thought gamers are just losers. They're just people that spend too much time playing video games. And as I saw them succeed, I learned that that could be me as well. Uh, while many games can be classified as esports, I mainly want to focus on the, some of the most popular ones. And the three that I want to explain are League of Legends, Valorant, and Fortnite. So League of Legends is a game where you and four of your friends compete against a team of five other people in order to outthink them, outsmart them, and just out outmaneuver them on a battlefield. And it's a game that helps build uh, critical thinking, uh, resource management, and negotiation skills as you have to work with your friends to solve these problems and agree all in real time. Valorant is very similar as well. It's a bit more fast paced. It teaches hand-eye coordination and helps you build your reflexes while also, while also dealing with the enemy. And Fortnite is a game that is mainly about time management, moving through, moving through different locations, scavenging, and also testing your reflexes. So I think these three games are very important and can teach students skills that they may not be able to easily learn. Stewie's feeling it. There's a good chance for Cloud9 to, we can, to get the Esports e has connected me with so many different people throughout the years. So many childhood and lifelong friends I've met simply because we play the same video games together. One of my friends I've known since I was 12 years old lives in, lived in Missouri in the middle of nowhere and just only played video games. He only came home to a small group of friends and played with us and he was, he was amazing. And he got so good at the video game that he played that a team in California flew him out to move to California and play for them under their organization. He, he didn't know where his life was going and truly he, he wasn't that interested. All he cared about was being the best at this video game and it paid off for him. Esports gives you an avenue to use your interests and make it more than just a waste of time. So another one of my friends, he's the co-president of Yale's League of Legends team. He's told me uh, countless times the skills he's learned in League of Legends and in esports has transferred over to his studies, his STEM research and just overall dealing with people. He says the way that he approaches problems now and deals with tough situations is just open. He has an open minded from all the experiences he's learned and been to win a major. It could hardly have been and more difficult. Being in esports is more than just about being a pro player. You don't have to be the best at the video game that you're interested in to be a part of esports. Esports is a collection of different jobs in different schools, such as social media management, uh, filmmaking, data analysis. It's, it's a variety of different jobs that we have to all come together and perform our best every day to make sure that the scene can grow. And the beautiful thing about esports is the equality it brings. For the first time on such a large scale, men and women can compete equally in a safe environment with and against each other. It's no longer of I am not as strong as a man so I can't play football with them or I'm not as tall as a basketball player so I can't play basketball. It's all about your self-discipline. It's about how well you can keep your emotions under control and how well you can get along with others. So you're no longer restricted to physical limitations in order to succeed at esports. It's a way that we can all reach our true potential. Game one and two and the potential comeback in game three. But so what I ultimately want 
to say is just think, be more thoughtful when a kid comes up to you and says, I want to be a pro gamer. Playing video games is more than just a waste of time. It's a way to build skills. It's a way to build meaningful connections. And it's a way to change their lives for the better positively. And I just want everyone to be more open whenever a young student comes up to you and says, I want to be a pro gamer when I grow up. My name is Hector Catano. Uh, I'm from Colombia. Um, I am an artist and musician. Um, I'm new to this country. I came here in 2017 uh, looking for love. Um, and then I found purpose uh, in, in AmeriCorps with AmeriCorps uh, and teaching art. Uh, as a visual artist too and musician, creating music and art. The story behind working and doing my service with AmeriCorps is um, I was interested in the beginning uh, because I, uh, like my ex-wife, she was not an AmeriCorps but she did Peace Corps. Uh, since I was given that I was not an American and I was an immigrant, I knew that I wanted to do something similar. Um, so I, 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 um, I met somebody who was uh, at some point a teacher who was involved with AmeriCorps and I thought that was a good opportunity for me to keep, um, you know, finding opportunities as a, as a teacher and artist. And so I just kept looking online. Um, before that I was just uh, kind of like doing menial work in you know different things I didn't like um, and um, so just in that search I um, came upon the their website and and one of the listings on Indeed and that's when I applied and, and met um, Paul Costello and Project Change uh, through project change, um, I was interested in keep you know doing some something related with art, and I looked on, I searched on the like um, America or America um, website listings uh, opportunities, and I found Arts on the Block, a nonprofit organization that is focused on strengthening uh, like youth and children's uh, life through art and they have this program uh, called Pour Your Art Out. At the same time, they were looking for somebody who can run a program that was starting at the moment uh, called YAM, the Youth Art Mo Movement. And um, um, so it, just like, it was just like, you know, like, like the starts were aligning at that moment. Uh, they were looking for somebody who can speak Spanish, they, who was bilingual mm, and who had experience in uh, teaching and you know in like social enterprises and um, and so yes that's, they were looking for that we got in contact uh, I got up like immediately I talked to Paul Costello the next day I was uh, I, um, 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 I, I got an email that I, I we were scheduled they were scheduling a, uh, an interview with me and that same day they said like you're hired you're you know, this, you, you are exactly with the person you're look, uh, we're looking for, and you're going to become the YAN manager. To become a manager and to, you know, like meet other artists and like um, you know, uh, like coordinate the different like events and like um, um, lessons and art activities that we do in, with Arts in the Block and YAM. Um, that it just enhanced and like like solidify who I was and and I was just like kind of like um, insecure at some point because of so many changes and uh, at this time after two years of uh, having worked with Arts in the Block 
and I found a good opportunity working as a, as a teacher um, in a school in DC. Um, so they saw what I was doing here one day. And they liked it. And then I, you know, I got, they called me and I'm now the, in the next, you know, next month I'm gonna start working with them uh, as a teacher, digital, digital art teacher and visual art teacher. And I think this is like another step in my um, career. That's, you know, another challenge that it came from what I was doing here. Assalamu alaikum. Ndo mufatu leti. Nda pata Gambia le. Ninke ba ya lafta. Nimpa ita school lafta kala scientist leti. Na inshallah lafta na master's degree kala next year. Mata aga kere research scientist ti. My name is Fatu. I was born and raised in Gambia. I am 23 years old. I moved to the U.S. in March of 2013 with my two brothers, one older and one younger. So I was 14 when I came here. My dad actually was here before me and as well as my mom and my younger sister who was born here. So we didn't meet her until she was two years old, two years after she was born. That's when we came here. Um, we basically moved here to be with both our parents and our sister. And when we came here, me and my older brother were in high school and our younger brother was in middle school. Our accent was very different from the kids in school and the school environment, the learning environment was very different from what we were used to growing up. Growing up, I've always been a very shy and timid person. I was not, I was very introverted. So it was extra hard for me to make new friends again. Um, however, being that I'm Muslim, I happened to see a Muslim student that was always alone um, during lunch. And so I decided, oh, we both have at least one thing in common that I know of. Let me try to approach her and be friends with her and see where I can go from there. And that happened to be one of the best decisions I've made in high school. Um, I was able to connect with her right away, even though we're both from different cultures. She's from Bangladesh, and like I said, I'm from Gambia, West Africa. Um, our differences basically made us become closer because we had something, um, we could always talk about something different about our culture and just learn about each other's diff um, cultures she told me about this club called Community Bridges in high school. It's an after-school all-girls program. And I figured, oh, it's an all-girls program. I feel comfortable because it's like all girls. I could just go talk and be myself. And so she convinced me, and I joined the club. And from there, that's when I made, I can say now, lifelong friends who I'm still close with. I, I came to know so many people and experienced so many different things outside of school, outside of the classroom that I didn't really learn in the classroom. I got to learn that outside of that. Um, for instance, the club, we were assigned mentors um, in the club. So it would, the mentors were people that would help guide us as individuals all throughout high school. And so I'm still in contact with that mentor that I met in high school. Um, it was actually through her that I'm here today. Um, the woman that was mentoring me through high school told me about this program once I graduated from Salisbury University in December of 20, 2021, last year. Um, and that's how I became to know about AmeriCorps and 
she introduced me to the woman she was in contact with and she also told me about going in for an interview and just seeing if it's the right fit for me before I start uh, my professional career in public health. I'm working with Community Bridges right now, which is, like I said, an all-girls program. And for me, it's just giving back and paying it forward and being there for the younger ones, like my mentor was for me. So I'm basically seen as a mentor to the younger kids. Um, it, it's like everything came back full circle. Um, so I, I've always had a passion for working with little kids and just, I've always loved kids. And so having that be as my job for now is just has been an incredible feeling. Although this country, I feel like a minority, um, I am a minority, um, and I feel like I'm always a target as a black person with a combination of also being a Muslim person, but that still doesn't stop me from being my own person and believing in myself. People are always going to judge no matter what. Um, and so it's up to me to not let their perception of me get to me, basically, and stop me from achieving whatever it is that I want to achieve. I had left knowing that it was time for me to leave um, for the future, for my future. I couldn't be in Seattle, I just couldn't do it. And I knew that I was leaving, you know. I knew that the window for me to leave was very small and I just escaped by the skin of my teeth. Because had I stayed, I don't think I would have ever left home. Last April, 2021, Amanda and I, um, I convinced Amanda, I should say, that we should fly out to DC uh, so I can pursue my master's that I obtained uh, this summer from Drexel. Um, so 2021, we fly in, we visit Silver Spring, we love the city. Um, we're here for two days, we explore, we go to DC, um, have an excellent time, and I just feel at home. Um, we get back to Seattle like the 26th of April. And I tell Amanda that this is where I have to go, you know, and we develop a plan to make that a reality. So um, Amanda buys in, Fast forward a couple months, she has a job. Um, I wanna say it's the end of May. She already has a job um, to move across the country. I don't have a job yet, um, but we still go. We leave June 13th. We arrive here, I land this AmeriCorps job. It's September now, um, and you know, I get the first couple checks from AmeriCorps, it's just not enough. Um, we're paying like $2,300 in rent. Uh, I'm, I have $600 excess money a month. You know, um, can't live like that. So I, end of September, you know, we, we try to do a budget, it's not working. Um, there's a whole bunch of tension in the relationship and I'm like, okay, gotta get a job. So I get a job at a seafood restaurant and that's been lovely. Chef Tony, shout out to you, you're the man. Come October, um, Diana started to get really sick, you know, with bone cancer. And that was kind of the second gut punch. Um, I'm in the throes of AmeriCorps. I'm working at the head office about Montgomery County Public Schools. Shout out to Stephanie and Everett, Dr. Bell, Ben, uh, Martha everybody. You've made my experience so lovely. Um, 
flash forward to November, kind of the third gut punch was that my dad started to go downhill. And his Alzheimer's was, you know, always visible and knowable, and I've known about it for years. Uh, but we saw a real decline late October, early November. You know, Diana was very sick uh, in specialized care. Um, my father, you know, would, was home alone, home alone a lot. And we saw the progression of the, 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 his disease. I flew back home, which I thought was gonna be for good. Uh, Diana passed away December 10th, December 10th, 2021. The day before my birthday. <laughs> So I flew back home and uh, I thought that was the time, you know, I was like, okay, there's no way I can leave now, you know, like I'm stuck. My dream is going to be on hold. I'm loving I'm working at the school district. I'm so fulfilled and so happy in Maryland. And then back home, everything's falling apart. So I'm at home, you know, it's December. Uh, I'm there December 13th through the 26th. I was just staying with my dad and living with him and, you know, he needed, at this point, he needed help with everything. He couldn't go to the grocery store, he couldn't drive his car. Come January, we decided that my father is no longer able to live by himself, so we, we put him in a um, retirement home, assisted living facility. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. I didn't mention the moving people st stealing our money back home, which is it's a funny story. Um, there is, you know, the event with Amanda's car insurance <laughs> taking like eight months longer than I thought it would be. You know, there's getting denied unemployment back home in that fiasco, um, which is now just getting resolved. This video is not all about the, the pain, right? It's about uh, the good, the laughs, and, the, and how far I've come, and um, I've got to work with so many amazing people, and I've got to make some really marvelous connections, um, and I have some phenomenal people in my corner. Funa, <laughs> I would not be here without Funa, uh, or Paul. The people who, they saw someone who was trying someone who was hurting obviously because I was hurting but they they took me under their wing and now uh, four months out from Mayor Corps I am hopefully landed the parent coordinator parent community coordinator <laughs> parent community coordinator position uh, full-time I hopefully will be in leadership Montgomery uh, that should be coming out soon I get married in April, 2023. I just want to summarize by the next storm that comes through, you know, my life. I want to understand that it will pass. And if you just hold on, you know, and ask for help and understand that it's okay to hurt, then the storm passes and you have gotten so much stronger.